Good afternoon. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Brittany Salisbury, and along with Christina Weil, I am um, the co-president of the Association of Print Scholars. And for those of you, you here today who aren't familiar with APS, we are an international nonprofit organization um, that encourages innovative scholarship on prints. And our membership is open to anyone who is interested in prints, including academics, curators, printmakers, conservators, dealers, collectors, um, you name it. We, uh, since we were founded in 2014, our membership has grown to almost 500 worldwide. And we would encourage you to find out more about the organization by visiting printscholars.org and to consider joining us. And so I'm very pleased to kick off our third Distinguished Scholar Lecture. Um, this series is intended to highlight research by established scholars in the field that represent the diversity of APS's membership. And so our first, our first lecture was given by a curator, P Peter Parshall. Um, last year's speaker was Harriet Stratus, a paper conservator. And this year, we are thrilled to be able to take advantage of our international membership with a lecture by Remy Mateen. Remy is a curator in the Department of Prints and Photographs at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, where he is responsible for the collection of 17th century prints. And in addition to his curatorial work, he also teaches courses on the history of prints at the École du Louvre and the École Nationale des Chartes. Since 2010, he has served on the Comité National de l'Estamp, a national organization focused on printmaking in France, and he serves as the editor of its scholarly journal, Nouvelle de l'Estamp. Remy holds a degree from the École Nationale des Chartes. Remy's talk this afternoon will draw upon his experiences working with the BNF's collection of 17th century prints and his expertise in that field. He has published two books, edited five others, and authored more than 25 articles on related topics, including the artist Simone Arnaud de Pompon, The History of Books in France, Jansenism, and Dip Diplomatic History. In 2015 to 16, he co-organized A Kingdom of Images with the Getty Research Institute, a groundbreaking exhibition that focused on the way that prints were made and understood during the reign of Louis XIV. Also focused on this period, his talk today is entitled A Means to an End, The Process of Understanding French Prints. Please join me in welcoming Remy. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. And I would like to thank all the people who organized uh, this talk. And above all, Brittany Salisbury and Christine Weid, who invite, invited me to come to New York City. I will try to speak English as well as I can, <laughs> um, uh, which is obviously not my first language. It's almost the first time I come here in, in New York City. I said almost because actually I already came once. It was in 2011 and I was on my flight back from Los Angeles where I was working on, in the Getty Research Institute with Luis Marquezano on our future exhibition called A Kingdom of Images, which took place there in 2015 and in the National Library of France in 2016. So I went to the New York Prince Fair in 2011 and was a little astonished by the kind of prints I could see there. It had actually little to do um, with the ones you can find in Paris, uh, in the main uh, print shop like Proutes and in the other shop or even at the fleas market. I don't want to caricaturize, uh, but a few of them were really old, and the ones we could see uh, which were basically from a very few uh, famous printmakers, uh, like Dürer, uh, Rembrandt, and so on. Uh, there was almost no French prints before the 19th century, which was a, a little surprising, since Paris was the most important place to produce prints, uh, at least from 1650 to 1800. We can see a similar phenomenon when we receive uh, the catalogues of the main dealers uh, or the auction, uh, like Sotheby's, Christie's, and so on, uh, at the Bibliothèque Nationale. Most of the time, the old master prints are just by a few printmakers and not the hundreds who engraved and published prints in the 17th century. This can 
of course be explained by the fact that we are talking about the art market. Only a few printmakers are internationally recognized as among the main artists, and very few are among the few world-renowned masters which are still fashionable nowadays. Given my experience in the Prince, Prince cabinet, Le Cabinet des Estampes, this approach gives a wrong impression of what prints were, especially in France during the Ancien Régime, the period between the Middle Age and the French Revolution. The prints and photograph departments of the French National Library, which is uh, the name of the Cabinet des Estampes since the 1970s, um, was uh, founded in 16. Uh, 67 uh, by Colbert, uh, Jean-Baptiste Colbert, uh, and by the King Lu 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 Louis XIV. So in, in, in 1670, in 1667, Colbert and Louis XIV decided that it was important for them, for the library and for the kingdom, uh, to collect as many prints as possible. Uh, given that they already are a, a little late uh, compared to uh, the uh, rising of uh, this uh, medium, they decided to buy a collection of prints uh, already collected by private people. The birth date, 1667, is the date of the purchase of the collection of Michel de, de Marolle, uh, a mundane abbot who has translated in verses the major part of Latin poetry. His collection was as big as 85,000 prints. You can see here uh, part of, of the stacks of the uh, Cabinet des, des, des Estampes, which, has, uh, which have moved uh, just a year ago because we are making major work in the Richelieu building of the BNF, and so this is the new place where we keep our prints, and this is uh, the folio prints, uh, they are organized by size, and so this is the folio room, and this is part of the reserve, the most precious uh, prints. So, I was t talking uh, about Michel de, de Marolle, the collector who is at the origin of our uh, Cabinet des Estampes. Uh, it was not uh, the only, only c c collection to arrive in the stacks of the King's Library. Uh, in 1667 is also created what we call the Cabinet du Roi, uh, which is uh, the fact that the King himself decided to, be, to become a prince uh, editor uh, to uh, order and to make prints at the Royal Library at that time. He also uh, bought, in the beginning of the 18th century, the, the collection of two major collectors, uh, the Marquis de, de Beringen, of, uh, the, who is the first squire of France, and that is to say, aid of the small stable of the king, one of the main court people at that time, and also of Roger de Gagnère, an antiquarian and genealogist, who was one of the earliest people to try to get images of all the ancient buildings in France, uh, which was the root of the notion of heritage. So, from the beginning, our collection is made from what you could get as a collector in that time, or even uh, what you could uh, order somebody to draw or to, to, uh, to publish. The way the Cabinet des Estampes is created is very important to understand the way people worked on print from 17th century to nowadays for several reasons. The Cabinet des Estampes is part of the Royal and then National Library, not part of a museum. Museum didn't even exist at that time. The Louvre was created during the revolution in 1693, uh, that is to say more than a century after that. And I myself am a library curator and not a, a museum cu uh, curator. Uh, from, the, from the start, French prints are considered as document, which you will find in library, uh, more than work of art. They are available for curieux, for curious people, for scholars, uh, but, but uh, not, not only as a work of art, but as a visual aid to do research, not only on contemporary art, but on antiquity, geography, history, what we now call ethnography, etc. 
And so our prints are not looked at with a retrospective eye. They are not old, old, old masters. The prints of the Cabinet des Estampes have always been uh, contemporary ones. We have always, always dealt with contemporary artists uh, from different times. And if we still receive contemporary artists nowadays, one of my colleagues works full-time with them, it has always been the case. In the 18th century, uh, when the head of the cabinet, uh, Hugues Adrien Joly, gets married, the main speech was pronounced by the main woodcut printmaker called Papillon. Third consequences of the, the organization of the cabinet. Unlike what happens in the US museums, they are not selected prints. There is no choice from curators or connoisseurs. Uh, some of them come from the, gift, from the gift of the purchase of private collections, as we said, some from the legal deposits. The legal deposit, which exists for books uh, since the reign of Francis I in 1537, also applies to prints, as precisely mentioned in 1642, and is linked to the possibility to get a privilege as, say, a legal text from 1672. Thus, the Cabinet des Estampes is supposed to get all the prints which are printed in France, which is obviously not totally the case, and didn't choose what it got. The only possibility to choose was ex exchanges, and doubles have actually been exchange exchanged till the 1980s. One last fact about the Cabinet des, des Estampes to understand French prints and how we worked uh, with them. Um, it's a huge corpus. Uh, so big that we don't know exactly how many prints we have. We usually talk about f 15 million items, 6 million prints, and 2 million early, mo early mo modern prints, but we really have no clue. To overcome this issue, our predecessors decided to work on the collection, not as you do in a museum or even libraries, but as in archives. They created a, f a framework uh, which meaningful series, a series called from A to E, A, B, C, D, E, where prints classified by their authors, from F to X by their, their subject, and Y, the literature about prints. It's still working now. Uh, when you are looking for a portrait now, you still have to go and have a look at series N when you search for a view of a French town or a village to sub-series VA. Uh, if you are looking at the representation of a saint uh, to the sub-series RC and so on. This system is very convenient when you want to have a look at all the ex libris, all the representation of St. Catherine, uh, all the representation of the assassination of Henry IV, Henry and so on. But it means that we do not know exactly what we have and what we don't have. When a reader asks us whether we have a specific print and send us an email, do you have this print? Uh, we have to search in the album about the printmaker, but also in other location depending on the subject in the various supplements etc. It can take a day and we are never sure not to have missed the print. Of course part of our job is to write catalogues of the oeuvre of the French printmakers but you can imagine we are never sure to have seen everything when the catalogue is printed. And actually beside French prints in the case of the Orstein compilers for French, uh, for uh, Flemish, Dutch and German prints, uh, the compilers usually fails to detect 20 to 50 percent of the prints we keep. So it's not so easy to uh, work with this huge corpus and it has uh, direct consequences on what we consider as French prints. But working in the National Library is a huge asset to understand what are prints. The collection is almost as old as French prints, and therefore we don't look at them at uh, almost religious items out of their context. They are here because we are here, and that's all. The, the collection is, is somewhat uh, representative of the Parisian pre pre production, including everyday prints. 
more or less, we will talk about that. Uh, the organization of the series show that prints are a much broader phenomenon than, gen than just art, and the importance of prints in the general thinking of 17th century European people has been recognized by King Louis XIV himself, uh, without whom we wouldn't even exist. So this was just the uh, the introduction to make you understand what the cabinet des estampes is to uh, be more clear about french prints uh, this is uh, pre pre precisely what uh, the problem we have uh, when we are working on french prints uh, one of the main problems when one wants to explain the print phenomenon during the ancien regime is that we are dealing with people no one knows there, there is still almost everything to do on them. An important part of my work is to compile the IFF, uh, l'IFF, l'Inventaire du Fonds Français, the Inventory of French Fund. Uh, that is to say, the catalog in alphabetical order of the French print, printmakers for the 17th century, as for me. But uh, when you study the prints first uh, and then try to find information on them, there are a, a lot of, of dead ends. Here is an example with the people we found called Le Roi, which is quite a usual name in French. Most of them just sign Le Roi fait uh, and we have no other information about them. So you have nine Le Roi printmakers, engravers or publishers at more or less the same time, around 100 prints and good luck to distribute the one with the others and begin to write a biography of each Le Roi. We all know we can only organize an exhibition as long as enough people come and see it. And for that, you, when you organize an exhibition, you have to deal with artists known by many people whose images are famous. This is obvious, obviously not the case for this kind of people no one has ever heard about. This is re really frustrating for us when you read uh, articles on the newspapers uh, saying that, uh, oh, you really have to come and see this painting exhibition because it has been the first retrospective for 20 years. When you are dealing with printmaking, it's almost impossible to display the work of a single artist. Even the very best one, uh, such as Robert Nanteuil or Gérard Hedlinck or Gérard Audran, uh, are not famous enough to organize an exhibition about them in Paris, uh, which is a problem when it's also difficult to publish a big illustrated book not related to an exhibition. Um, so uh, we, when we are de de dealing with French prints, we are de dealing with ordinary people. Most of them are more uh, craftsmen than artists, and it's very difficult to be able to publish on them uh, outside of very specific journals, such as Nouvelle de l'Estampe or, or so on. And so it's very difficult to make people aware that the print phenomenon is a major one to understand the visual culture in the 17th century century. My last article is precisely about this uh, fact that there are ordinary people using a tool that had never been used before, which is called the general role of arms. Uh, about uh, heraldic stuff. Uh, actually, in, in France, uh, no one can use a coat of arms. You don't have to belong to the nobility or to be granted one by the king or anyone. Uh, some people used one and others don't, depending on their social needs and habits. The general rule of arms is, is fascinating. You can have a, see a, a page of it here. Uh, because uh, King Louis XIV decided that for the first time in French history, no, no one could bear a coat of arms if it was not registered in a special armorial made by the king's herald called uh, Dozier. And soon it became even more interesting because the king did it for tax reasons. At the beginning, the idea was each person who bear a coat of arms has to pay 20 pounds to register it. But soon it became Every person that is wealthy enough to pay 20 pounds must register a coat of arms. It is therefore a major document to find out the so social status of people at, at that time. 
in this document, with more than 100,000 coat of arms, you will only find two printmakers. Uh, whereas you can find about 15 booksellers, 15 painters, and of course a lot of lawyers and so on. The identity of those two printmakers are interesting. One is Sébastien Leclerc, one of the main etchers of 17th century France, a member of the Academy and a drawing professor of the King's family. It's not surprising to find him here. But the other one is Charles, Charles Mavelot. You may never have heard of him. It's totally normal. Uh, there is no catalogue of his work and is not famous at all. He mainly engraved monograms and writing models uh, to learn to write in a beautiful writing. Actually, we can find a third one, Jacques Chevillard, who is a printmaker, but mainly a print, a print publisher, spe specialized in heraldic prints, but is listed as spice, mm, spice merchant, uh, which is more prestigious than printmaker at that time. <laughs> so do not think that uh, artists are prestigious people because they deal with history of art and creation. They are mostly poor, poor people, and the ones who differ do so because they are linked to elites or even the, the royal family as professor, other of portraits, and so on. Therefore, we cannot assume that only fine prints are interesting. They are not representative of prints, and it gives us a very bad representation of what prints are, uh, by whom they are made, by whom they are bought, keep, kept, and used. The problem is that most of the prints we display in museums and exhibitions are these fine artistic prints, which is misleading. We tried to show in our exhibition, A Kingdom of Images at the Gettys and the BNF, the large use of prints made at that time. This craving for images explained that so many people in the print industry, uh, that so many people worked in the print industry, creating images, engraving them, publishing them, editing them, selling them, coloring them, copying them, etc. It was a lot of work that, uh, uh, that could be provided for a lot of people. Prints were just images, and images are used for a lot of purposes, actually more or less the same than, than today. So, um, the first part of the exhibition, uh, uh, A Kingdom of Images, was about pro propaganda, because we felt that people tend to think that uh, when uh, images are, are, are published at that time when Louis XIV is so uh, important, controls so much uh, what is, is published in France, everything had to do with Louis XIV. It's not uh, wrong, of course, and you can see here a good example of what can be published at that time, which is a, a thesis. Uh, a very big print with the, um, uh, the main conclusion of a thesis, uh, a university, university thesis, uh, with the portrait of the people to whom it is uh, given uh, above, so with the 14th year, but you have to be aware that prints are also this kind of things, which is also propaganda, but in the other way around, and so it is Protestant people in Paris whose temple is destroyed in 1685, and they also use images to make propaganda and to make people from Paris aware that Louis XIV is the devil destroying their, their temple. So it's really bad, but it's also very rare and uh, very interesting to, to, to understand what people could do, uh, even if it was for forbidden to uh, sell this kind of print. And actually, re re religion remains the main re reason to print and distribute prints uh, with a huge uh, diversity uh, in this kind of things. Um, but uh, above all, prints are rarely actually an end in itself. They are rather, at that time, a trigger to something else, to do something else, to make uh, something else, and that's precisely why, the, why they are so interesting. Decorative art prints are 
of course, uh, very, very, very well known, and the French ones are not uh, really different from the Flemish or Dutch or German or I I I Italian ones, but it's important be be because they really are a trigger to build new work of art, to spread a test, taste, to give ideas. They are massively powerful tools that explain a lot when talking about a visual, a visual culture. And even artistic prints uh, are n not only created to be hung on a wall, they are a way to spread the knowledge of a work, of a new taste, of new patterns, and it will um, be used elsewhere by, by other people. This is uh, an example of it, of course, a very well-known painting by Poussin, Le Ravissement de Saint-Paul, uh, which is in the US, I think. Uh, and very quickly, there are a lot of prints showing this, uh, what this painting look like, uh, which is really interesting because when you have a look at what you can find in France and even in small villages, you will find some copies of the painting. Of course, uh, the people who have painted uh, these things in the middle of nowhere in southwest France in uh, the, the department de la Dordogne in, well, far away from Paris. It's very nice, but very far. Uh, I've, I've, ne I've never seen the, the painting by, uh, by Poussin, but they or their colleague or the, their friends have bought a print representing this uh, painting, and so they, they can, well, uh, make not really a copy, but an adaptation of the painting by, uh, uh, by Poussin. So print is a, is a catalyst, and uh, more than that, we can even assume that print was a successful, successful medium because it gives it to the user the freedom to do something else and something more. Um, we can have a very simple example of uh, this uh, phenomenon, which is in my opinion, major to, to understand uh, the link people at that time could have with uh, Prince. Uh, this is a page from QB1 series. Uh, QB1 is our series about historical uh, event. Uh, the main part had been created by a councillor at the Parliament of Dijon in, in Burgundy in 18th century, uh, which, whose name is uh, Feuvray de Fontette. And Feuvray de Fontette decided to uh, create an history of the world by I images. And so he, co he collected a lot of prints, he pasted it uh, on albums and wrote some uh, text to explain what the event is, uh, is about. Of course, it's not so easy to do so uh, because uh, sometimes you want to talk about events, but you don't have any images to show. And so you just, uh, you can just uh, transform an image into something else, which is the case here. He's talking about uh, the siege of a small town called Lure in the east of France near Switzerland, but there is no images to show this uh, event. So he decided to find uh, a view of another town. He added a vineyard because there are some vineyards there and he wrote down Lure and so this prince becomes uh, the representation of Lure. It was not intended uh, to, to be it but it has become it because the user wanted it uh, to, to be Lure. So the meaning of the image can totally change depending on the use of the image, which can be a kind of, of a puzzle when you have to describe it as a curator. Of course, it's, it's a view of city A, and you can find it described like this in, in catalogs, but it's used in your album as a view of city B. What should we say about it, and how can we explain that it's in an album about, for example, antiquity, when it's supposed to represent a Bible uh, uh, episode. So you have to deal with this kind of uh, phenomenon when you describe it in your catalog or your, your databases. And to, to ask what the real meaning of this image. Uh, 
Of course, the word will doesn't mean anything. If you are a specialist of prints or a curator, you will be interested in the plate, uh, which tell you which state of which print it is, and the rest is purely a conjunctural change made on a single proof. But if you are interested in visual culture, you can decide that the important phenomenon is what you see, no matter uh, if it is accurate or not. If everybody consider that Lure looks like this, no matter if it's true or not, it becomes a real because some people told it and some people believed it at that time. And thus, we need to keep this uh, double voir, like you say, a double, uh, double entendre, uh, taking into account both the perception of the printmaker and the one of the user. Uh, this double work is sometimes even intended by the printmaker and or the publisher who need the work of the user to create an accurate tool. One good example of this can be found once more in heraldic prints. This is uh, the kind of prints uh, which are printed in 17th century France, uh, which, were co which were called une carte, uh, like a map, but uh, not, not, not a carte de géographie, a carte uh, heraldic, an heraldic card, uh, representing the coat of arms of many people. And uh, of course, the goal was to be as accurate as, as possible. Uh, the problem is that time flies and everything changes. You can buy the list and representation of all the French cardinals, which is the case here, of uh, all the members of parliament, etc. But within a few years, the list won't be accurate anymore. Some of the cardinals will be dead, new ones will have been created by the Pope, etc. It's the exact problem we still have when we pre publish books on paper or the same kind of issue we can find on Wikipedia, how to keep pages up to date. Some of the prints have taken this problem into account and accepted as a fact that part of the job is to be made by the buyer. Uh, the print is still a mean, the end being to have an accurate in information. Two solutions here. Um, you can either provide the new information as new prints, and so you keep uh, space to paste new prints you will buy one by one, and uh, when there are a new, uh, new cardinal, you, you will buy just the little print with this coat of arm that you will paste there, or the, the people can do it by themselves. You, you can see it here, uh, where... Uh, you can see uh, that uh, this is just a little sheet of paper which is pain, uh, pasted uh, with the, the coat of arms which has been uh, draw, uh, drawn by uh, the, the owner of this print and uh, the X and the Y one are uh, printed ones uh, which have been, by, uh, have been bought and pasted on, uh, on the card. So you uh, will be able to find, uh, sometimes it's really rare to find them uh, this way, this kind of little part of uh, the print with just uh, the uh, new little pieces you will have to paste on your, on your card uh, with uh, the names or the, the coat of arms. And you can see that uh, you have different plates that are used and they are printed on the same sheet of paper because paper was expensive at that time. Um, mm -mm -mm. So the, um, the publisher inco incorporated this need in their production and are perfectly okay that their prints are not, fi are not finished by uh, themselves. So, sometimes he even realizes that not only uh, form but also substance need the help of clients and thus we can find sentences like this one. Uh, Messieurs qui seront si après reçus auront la bonté d'envoyer leur nom et armes chez le sieur Chevillard. That is to, to say, the new people who are received are, as a councillor in the parliament can send their name and their coat of arms to the publisher so that we will be able to add them uh, in our, our cards. So it, it's, it's a kind of crowdsourcing with the, the, the people having to give information so that the print is the most accurate uh, as, uh, as possible. 
some, some of the prints enroll the buyer and the user in their creative and informative pro process. The last phenomenon I want to talk uh, about uh, goes even further in the use of a print and in the assumption that prints can be tools to do something else, turned into something new. These are work of a, of a man who is also completely unknown by almost everybody, uh, but who fascinates me because he seems to, to be just the kind of prince people nobody cares about uh, uh, when he has done so many different things and very creative ones. His name is Francois de la Pointe. He was born in 1640 in a little city in the east of France near Lorraine called Verdun, which you may know for the World War battle. Uh, his father was a captain in the army, and he himself became, became an engineer and geographer. He learned to draw, to make maps of, of strongholds and maps of battles. Uh, we keep at the BNF several tens of maps uh, that he has drawn uh, like that. Being able to draw and to get geographical information from a place, he also works for mat maps publishers. Apparently, he learns how to, engraves, how to engrave and begins to, to publish maps. Uh, that may be a reason why he also be begins to become friends uh, uh, with people from the print world. He gets married with the sister of Pierre Brissard, a famous printmaker of the time, with whom he sometimes works, for example, to finish the view of the Chateau de Vincennes for the Cabinet du Roi. Still, his geographical background re remains important, and uh, above all, he engraved letters, uh, for example, uh, an entire book called The Abrégé de la Vie et Passion de Notre Sauveur, de notre sauveur uh, so a brief life and passion of our Savior Je Jesus Christ, uh, published in Paris in March 1663, uh, and he also engraved Coats of Arms, uh, for example, he publishes the Coat of Arms of the Knight of the Order of the Holy Spirit. But uh, the prints I'm talking about now are not the ones he has engraved. Actually, uh, the role played by each actor in the making of a print is uh, written in the print uh, itself. In 1670 France, uh, you will still find written in, in Latin the role of people, uh, uh, these people... Um, uh, I lose my word, um, well, uh, engraved, uh, draw, um, as drawn, as engraved, uh, uh, etc. And it's, uh, it, it's written in, uh, in Latin in the 17th century, whereas it will be in French in the 18th century. Uh, on the works I'm t talking to you about, we also find uh, verbs in uh, Latin, but which are not uh, the one we usually find on prints. Of course, we still find fecit, uh, which is rather ambiguous, uh, but you will find uh, the word uh, kelawit, the word formawit, and the word ornawit. Which, which means so uh, made beautiful, uh, engraved or also made beautiful, and also made beautiful. So it's ambiguous too, and it's uh, still uh, difficult to, to understand what it can mean when you find it. But uh, it means one thing that uh, De La Pointe considers is uh, this kind of sheet, like work, works of art, worthy of bearing his name, like one usually does in the print world. Uh, I will find you one of these work. Uh, actually, you can find these works by De La Pointe in three different series in the Cabinet des, uh, des Estampes. The first one is QB1, I told you about, made by Fevret de Fontette in the 18th century. Uh, the other two, uh, other two are uh, once more heraldic one, one from a 17th century amateur called Fouquet, and the other one from Roger de Gagnière himself. Uh, 
uh, these plates are useful. They are not only decorative one, but have a very special purpose. And indeed, uh, the same as today, they are uh, dividers uh, to put in an album to arrange document by place or by year. Uh, when Favret de, 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 de Fontette uh, de, de decides to create an album about uh, 1638, uh, it begins by this uh, to uh, make people aware that we are going to talk about 1638. And these plates are a remix of different prints that had been published before. Each one is unique and is the result of a kind of work which has become very rare and is therefore almost completely unknown to art historians. Uh, prints are indeed uh, considered as raw materials to create something new, just as a surrealist artist in, in the 20th century uh, or people in the internet today. Uh, he just takes prints, uh, cut them, and then creates something new with uh, a collage uh, way of, of, of working. So, so, so sometimes it can be all over, or you, you, you can just use a blank pa page and then paste uh, just a little part uh, of it. S sometime, of course, it's not totally perfect with the prints you can get, uh, so as a drawer and, and calligrapher, it will add some uh, lines uh, so, so somewhere to finish the, the prints he uses. So uh, the very black ones are etching, and you can see uh, some lines added by De La Pointe to make it better. Uh, De La Pointe chooses a lot of prints he could get to create this in an original way, and uh, some of those uh, sheets are really, really complex since you, you can have sometimes more than 15 prints uh, rearranged to create this kind of things. Here you, you have a, a print for the, the, the bottom, the coat of arm is added uh, using silver. Uh, then you have uh, one here, Bresse is written by, uh, rewritten by uh, de, de, de La Pointe. Then there is a third one, a fourth one, a fifth one, uh, seven, eight, and I think that uh, that's it. <clears throat> so it's uh, sometimes uh, and often uh, very, very uh, complicated with uh, also an important part of this work which is uh, uh, illumination and above all for coats of arm and the name of, uh, of provinces like on this one where he uses real gold uh, to uh, for the crown uh, the scepter the the sword and and so on uh, of course, it's easier for him when the plate he reuses have a place planned to receive a text, and that's why frontispieces are often used, like in this example where you can have the frontispiece of the book here, and it's just cut off a place here and write a new, a new text here. There is no logic whatsoever in the choice of the prints he reuses. We cannot link it to the people he knows. Uh, I told you that he was the brother-in-law of Pierre Brissard, but there is only one print by Pierre Brissard in, in his work, but uh, he will use sheets by uh, Leclerc, Le Pôtre, Cossin, Antoine Dieu, Chauveau, with no particular logic. Some images I, I used several times, so we can imagine that he is able to buy prints that are not interesting anymore, and so he can buy them for a few pounds and so uh, use them a, a, a lot of time. But it's very hard to uh, find a real logic behind the, the, the way he, he works, uh, creating some real uh, well, kind of paintings. It, like uh, in this, this one is very representative, where he, he, he creates a scene in, in itself uh, using prints which have nothing to do with uh, what they seem uh, here. For, for, for example, here you, you have um, a 
tapestry of the king uh, that he will cut and paste to make a, a new wall of this uh, imaginary room. You can see here. Uh, <clears throat> and I, I told you that uh, nobody uh, really cares about this kind of prints. And uh, we can uh, re re remind that for a long time, you illuminated prints were considered as altered by the color. They lost their original purity. Uh, we used to say in, 16, uh, in 17th or 18th century that to, to paint a print is to spoil a, a, a print. And uh, w w what is funny is that you can find the same phen phen phenomenon here on the plate for 1685. My, my colleague uh, uh, Maxime Préau uh, found out uh, that it used a print by Sébastien uh, Leclerc and wrote on the sheet that it was disfigured by the collage. Uh, so so even 15 years ago, it was not considered as an interesting cultural phenomenon, but, but as something you should never do with such beautiful prints uh, like uh, Sébastien Leclerc's one. It's really hard to insert uh, such a practice in the history of art. Is it art or is it craft? Uh, who is the real work by? Uh, what, what about the authorization of the original artist? Should, should he be listed among the others, even if he didn't know what would be made of his print? But um, this kind of work uh, are among the examples that show you the diversity uh, of prints is far greater than you can imagine. That they can be used for a lot of different purposes. They involve a lot of different workers and are very complex. Uh, most, most of the time, a lot more that we can imagine. Uh, so that it's really hard to understand what we can see uh, today when we just find prints we cannot understand. Once we have uh, for forgotten that, uh, that they are only work, works of art, we can treat them like any other d d document or even any other piece of data. But uh, what do we do now? Of course, uh, they, as I told you, there is still a lot of work to do on French prints, French ancient print, French 17th century prints, and research begins with catalogues, and we are still lacking them. So there is still a lot of space to continue to write catalog raisonné of printmakers like we do in the 19th century or 20th century. And of course, we still need good data and system that enables us to do new research. It's a real issue for, for, for us at the BNF, where most of the catalogue were, were published as books uh, till not so long ago. And so we still uh, lack a, a proper database to search in our, our catalogue, and we are working on it. I'm currently working with a private company uh, to convert the entries on paper um, to entries on the database, which is not so easy. Um, uh, doo -doo -doo. Mm -hmm. uh. Yeah, for, for example, uh, it's really uh, easy to explain to somebody with words uh, what a print here, uh, what, what a print is. Uh, when you uh, meet a special print, you, you can still explain, uh, writing down a, a paragraph of text, what happened there. But uh, when you try to, to put it in the databases, it's uh, much more uh, d d difficult. Uh, for, for, for example, it's easy to explain in a text that, that, that there is one print in uh, three different states, uh, that uh, then a copy has been made a few years l later, that the plate has been bought by someone else who put the name on the plate, and then a second c copy has been made, etc. But it's way more difficult to put it in catalogs and trees with proper links, so, so that you can understand the history of this image when you search in a database. Same story when you have sheets of paper which include several images and some text, uh, usually used only one time, but sometimes the engraver reused one of the images for a, another sheet. Uh, we, when we con convert uh, 
catalogs in books form to uh, the, the, the databases, we constantly have to ask what uh, granulometry we should use. Should we, we describe each plate, uh, for this example, three for the, for, for the sheet, or each sheet, which is intellectually the right thing to do, but maybe uh, di difficult when, when dealing with uh, computer uh, sciences. Uh, a lot of questions arise and lead us to have a deeper look on these very complex objects uh, which are prints. We above all have uh, this problem with the new cataloging st uh, standards, uh, especially in uh, libraries uh, where we get rid of the old uh, mark system and go to the new RDA system. It's a little technical, but uh, it's really better, but we have to invent uh, almost everything about it. And people who invented this kind of uh, working uh, had made it thinking of books and not of prints. So we have to invent almost everything. Uh, and uh, all the work we do as curators, above all, lead us to always have a new look on, on the print uh, and to ask questions which, which still have no answer yet. Wandering through the collections of the BNF is perfect for, for that, both challenging and frustrating. You will always find new documents. You have no clues what really is. I tried to display a few cases through this talk. It enables us to be open-minded and keep asking us questions about the visual culture of a society which is different from ours, and mostly admitting that we still don't know or understand much. One last example, a frustrating one. Why do we print portraits? For whom? What do they do with them? Why the hell would you want to have the printed portrait of a state councillor in your home? We have to be clear and confess that we don't really know. And that's why we keep working on this, uh, on this uh, subject, uh, edit paper, and welcome researcher in uh, our st study room. And I hope we will see you in Paris soon. Thank you. Thank you. After that really interesting talk, I have just one mundane question, and then maybe other people have more interesting ones. But um, for all your um, bound albums of oeuvre of individual artists, are you now going to go through and catalog on your database the individual prints set into each of those albums? Is that part of your goal? Uh, not uh, directly here, uh, actually. Um, the albums are not the only part of the oeuvre of the artist. We have supplements. Uh, uh, so um, the first part of the work uh, will be uh, what I told you to uh, take the printed catalogues we made from 1930 to today and uh, put it in our database, uh, which means that we will have, uh, within two years, uh, the catalog of all the 17th century French printmakers from letters A to, letters, to letter L. Uh, for the work from letter, letter L to the end of the alphabet, it has not been done yet. Uh, so for some of them, there are some catalogues uh, made uh, during a PhD thesis or something like, uh, like that. So we can use them, but it, it's a lot of work to put it in, in the, the database. Otherwise, um, we will uh, certainly change the way we work. Uh, it's a kind of scoop. Uh, we will stop the IFF like we do today. And uh, there is... 90% chance, we will work with Holstein. Uh, and so we won't be uh, linked to the alphabetical order, which is nice because you have to deal with all the printmakers, but uh, which means that we work on very 
uh, little artist before we work on important ones. Uh, so uh, working with Holstein, we will be able to select uh, the main artist and above all, uh, some people outside the BNF will be able to work as compilers. And so the first uh, Holstein catalog, French Holstein, we are going to do, if we do so, uh, will be uh, artist, uh, PhD student worked on the last five years. So the Bonnard family, uh, Grégoire Huret, uh, well, some, some people like that. And uh, we will be able to work uh, more quickly. Uh, yeah and to choose who we work on. But there will still be a lot of prints we won't catalog, and we'll, well, we are looking for a solution uh, to continue to work on those little French artists nobody will ever work on if we don't. Uh, so uh, we are uh, working with BNF uh, computer system people uh, to try to create an online IFF uh, so that the big artist uh, would be in Holstein and the little one could, could be made in a few days by ourselves uh, online. I know your collection started in the 17th century, but um, I was interested in um, 16th century artists from Fontainebleau. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, Francis I imported a lot of Italian artists, and they were already printmakers, but they were making artistic prints. Um, so are, are you going to include those in your collection? Yeah, uh, of course we have them. A very nice collection of uh, Fontainebleau and uh, Renaissance prints. Um, I'm forgetting her name. Uh, Catherine Jenkins has worked on, a, on, on it, so uh, we have a lot of data about them, about these prints, so uh, one day or another we really want to describe them properly. Uh, it will depend on Catherine, who, well, who has personal problems and so on. So we, well, we have a nice collection. It's a, it, it, it's a available, it, it's uh, described on books and uh, well, you can find out what we have quite easily if you go to a study room and have access to the literature ab about it. But it's part of the prints we want to highlight and to digitize and so on. Uh, but still we, lack like, um, people working on it. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, um, I would just like to say that Catherine Jenkins' three volumes were just published. I just received my copies. Mm -hmm. um, and all of the BN's holdings are in it, original and reproductive, which she has worked on. Um, so it's available through Sound and Vision. It's fantastic. <laughs> who, was the, who was the artist uh, that did the that beautiful picture of Christ who was named it? Who was on this side? Um, uh, uh, Nicolas uh, Nicola Poussin. Yeah, put that on it. So the, the, this one. Hmm. Yeah. It's okay, it, uh, go, go forward where there's more. Next one, please. Yeah. That's oh. Uh, those are uh, completely anonymous. Uh, so it's uh, in uh, this one is a private place. Uh, well, you, you can see the mark of the real estate uh, seller. Uh, actually, it's uh, you can buy the uh, the place. Uh, you have a, a very nice 17th century library, and this is the ceiling of the library. So if you have about two million euros, uh, you can have a nice place in France. <laughs> and uh, this one is in uh, a very nice church with uh, several uh, panels l like this. It's uh, only one of, I don't know, four or five. Uh, not far away from you know, uh, there, uh, like uh, it's about uh, 200 kilometers from Toulouse. Jean Le Postre actually includes it in a print showing a ceiling design to show that this was suggested to put it at the center of the ceiling so that 
Yeah, but uh, this is a ceiling, but uh, it's not. Uh, this is just on on a wall, uh, so they do what they want. <laughs> this is not a question about prints, but as a former habitué, if you could show the Bibliothèque Nationale La Salle La Brosse. Uh, As a former habitué of that room, <laughs> when it was the uh, regular research room of the Bibliothèque Nationale, could you explain the structuring, the operations of that room? Because that that uh, large desk in the center is something new. Yes. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the main room of uh, Richelieu B building of the Bibliothèque Nationale. So the the old Bibliothèque Nationale before the new building. Uh, was built in the 1990s. Uh, it is now completely uh, renewed, reworked. Uh, it is still uh, the well the. They are still working on it now. Uh, actually, uh, they worked on the one half uh, during five years, and now they are working on the other half uh, during five more years. And the, the study room of the Cabinet des, des Estampes is in the second part. So for five years, we are in this room, which was the main room, the, the study room of the printed uh, collection of the Bibliothèque Nationale uh, from uh, the building of this room in, in 1860s uh, to uh, the construction of the new one. Uh, some changes have been made, so now it is the above all the reading room of the library of the Institut National d'Histoire de l'Art, INHA, uh, but uh, the Prince Department is here uh, for the five years uh, waiting for the study room to be completed. So uh, this is the desk of the president de salle, the chairman of the room, the, the curator in charge of both rooms. Um, and then you have uh, seats to work. Uh, if you go to, to Paris as historian of art, you should definitely go there. Uh, you have access to a lot of books uh, by yourself on, on the stacks. It's uh, really convenient. And so this quarter is uh, the study room of the Prince uh, Department. Uh, it was dark before, and now it's uh, with a, f a lot of light and beautiful, uh, the the paintings uh, has been completely uh, renewed. It's uh, it's really a major change. It's uh, really nice. And f for for the first time for for us, it's also very very. Uh, very convenient because, as you may have understood, um, the Cabinet des, des Estampes is old, and so uh, people tried to uh, make things work uh, as they could during three centuries. So it was a, a little messy at the end because we had no uh, space, uh, not enough space, and we tried to put albums where we could and, and so on. So it was really hard to find an album. Uh, it, even if it's supposed to be in alphabetical order with this series, it was really hard to find them. And the re renovation and these new stacks uh, for make that for the first time we have all the albums in, uh, in the alphabetical order, which is really nice. You can find what you search. It's, it's a blessing. Uh, we will be uh, there for five or oh, four or five years, and after that we will keep some of the stacks, and uh, some of them will be uh, let to other departments uh, because we will get our normal stacks, our old stacks, uh, back uh, renewed. <laughs> Um, as, in regards to the uh, the collage that you showed by Adila Pont, um, do you have any any idea, or is there any indication of whether it was presented to the king, or what the intention was for this book of collages? 
no, uh, it was not presented to the king. It's purely a, a private uh, order uh, from uh, amateurs, uh, and I think that it, it was to organize the the collection. You have um, seen that uh, some of them are about dates, and some of them are about. Uh, Provinces or uh, countries in part of a part, part of the world, and so it, it was just a kind of uh, divider uh, to uh, organize prints about events or about uh, for the provinces. I don't know if it's about uh, maps or uh, heraldic prints, uh, but it's definitely just a tool to say, okay, here are. All I've got about Bretagne uh, and and so on. So uh, it, uh, De La Pointe is part of those kind of print people, uh, which are not printmaker by themselves, but around them. And uh, a lot of people worked like this and are totally invisible if you don't uh, fall on this kind of thing or uh, find the uh, document in archives. Uh, but they are very numerous, but f forgotten by the history uh, of art, and which is a pity. <laughs> Um, I, I was wondering, just actually following up on the question about De La Pointe, I wasn't clear, was he, was he a printmaker, was he engraving his own plates or was he just doing those collages? And in which case, I was just very interested in those, the uses of those different Latin terms, which seem actually to be quite meaningful or could potentially be quite meaningful. And I think maybe more nuanced than you suggest. And I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that. He was a printmaker, but when doing this collage, he never uses his own print. Uh, his prints are only uh, maps, uh, coat of arms, and uh, text. And uh, when doing this this uh, this this collage, he uses uh, well um, artistic patterns and frontispieces and uh, prints by somebody else. Uh, well, uh, I just show you a bunch of them, but there are uh, more than 100 uh, in three series. Uh, I didn't find out a real meaning for these words. Um, maybe like, um, I don't know, 15 or 20 are signed uh, with these uh, four verbs. Uh, and I don't find any logic to the use of one term or another. Though it's still the same kind of thing, uh, but uh, w w when he uses the verb "kelawit," it's supposed to be uh, engraved. Mm -hmm. But uh, th th there is a second meaning, which is just to uh, to make beautiful, to 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 uh, adorn, and he doesn't engrave. So I think it's just a synonymous for for mawit or something like that. I was interested, the print that you showed that was transformed to become a village called Lure. Yeah. Do you know the source? Do you happen to remember the source of that print, or do you not know? No, I, I haven't searched, uh, I haven't looked for it. It's typically uh, one of the problems we have and why it's so difficult to catalog prints in our collection, you just have this. And so if you want to catalog, you have to find out what it is. So it will take you uh, a few minutes if you know very well uh, all the prints, but uh, some days or you will never find out if, if, if you don't know. <laughs> so uh, I have no clue. <laughs> The reason I ask is because I was looking at Tassin, the geographer's yeah. book of all of these uh, townscapes, and I wondered if Tassin, if that compilation was full of original prints or if they too were taken from other city views. So that doesn't ring a bell. <laughs> uh, no, uh, no, I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, But there are a lot of copies, and well, uh, 
well, um, when you say that you uh, make a print uh, out of, of the very one place, or uh, if you make a portrait with the people just in front of you, etc., uh, often you you tell it uh, because it's an argument to to, to sell, to, to say that it's accurate because I, I, I was there, uh, which is often the, the case for uh, views of battles and, uh, and so on. People say, I was there, it was like this, and so you can buy my prints, I, I speak the truth. Uh. <laughs> Um, just a, a quick question about related drawings, particularly in the 17th century, you've got a lot of big names and some lesser names doing uh, drawings that aren't just technical drawings for prints. Is there any attempt with the uh, uh, IFF to make some, you know, where we know that there are drawings to, in your catalogue, to make that connection so that people uh, see the prints also as works of art with these related drawings? Yeah, uh, we have a lot of drawings actually uh, at the Cabinet des, des Estampes and uh, one of my colleagues is working specifically on drawings uh, to make them more visible and we think that we have the second collection of old drawings in France, uh, which few people know. Uh, uh, so uh, in uh, the IFF, actually in the last uh, volume which were made by Maxime Préau, who took a lot of time to make a perfect catalogue and so on. Uh, the drawings are always uh, mentioned when he has found out where they are. Uh, we are trying to keep this information in the, the, the database. Uh, we are always interested in that kind of thing. Uh, with the new uh, cataloging standard, uh, it's, it's a standard which is supposed to be used by almost everyone and even the private uh, uh, websites such as uh, we, we, Wikidata and so on. It, it's supposed to be transferable from one site to another and so on. So we really want not uh, just to work on our collection but to be able to create links between uh, all the, the the collections so that it's easy to uh, find out uh, things and we are still buying uh, drawings uh, actually in France uh, for the national collections the artistic drawings are bought by the Louvre and the, the drawings which are technical or preparatory for print are bought by us uh, after that it's also a question of mom, of money <laughs> uh, the Louvre has much more money than us to buy these kind of things so sometimes we find an agreement and as long as it's available for researchers it's totally okay for us <laughs> 